Good to have you all here. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. Carolyn Meltzer, who's the chair of radiology, and as you can see, she's uh, she is the William Patterson Timmy Professor and Chair. And Carolyn's background is really in neuroradiology and PET imaging and neuroreceptor function. But she's here today to talk to us about another important issue and and really an ongoing uh, discussion we've had about unconscious bias. We had a lecture a few weeks ago about this, and it's really a very important issue for us all to think about. It impacts us when we select residents or we take care of our patients, and, and it really helps shape the structure of medicine as, as we know it. And so, and Carolyn is uh, very experienced in this, and we're looking forward to her, her discussion. Welcome, Dr. Melton. Thanks, Bob. Thank you all. Um, okay, let's see if I can make sure. Oh, okay, something magic. Yes, when I walked in, I said, um, I'm here with my slides, and I was told, oh, we already have your slides. It's on the immune response of something, and I thought, um, that's probably not, not my slides. <laughs> you don't want me talking about that. <laughs> All right. Okay, so uh, see if that'll move. There we go. Okay. So title of my talk is Whistling Vivaldi. Um, has anyone heard of the book named Whistling Vivaldi? Okay, we'll talk about that in a second. So, as Bob said, we're here to talk about unconscious or implicit bias. And it, there are a lot of definitions of this term, but if you think about it as our attitudes or stereotypes or inherent biases that we have, uh, that we've accumulated with life in terms of our experiences that affect our understanding, how we behave, decisions we make that we're not conscious of, um, that affect people. And they're about groups. They're pretty pervasive. So, you know, after you get to a certain age, it's hard to say, well, I, you know, I'm going to shed my biases. Um, and importantly, they don't necessarily align with our declared beliefs. So we may feel strongly about being very egalitarian and still possess biases. And generally, they tend to favor our, ourself, our own group, but not always. They are malleable, yet pervasive, and we'll talk about that. <clears throat> so Whistling Vivaldi is the name of a book by Claude Steele. And um, he writes about, in very eloquent terms, his experiences as a black young man um, walking down the street in the city, and the sort of the, the reaction, sometimes couples would clench each other more closely or cross the street. And um, he says, out of nervousness, I began to whistle and discovered I was good at it. On the street at night, I whistled popular tunes from the Beatles and Vivaldi's Four Seasons. The tension drained from people's bodies when they heard me. A few even smiled as they passed me in the dark. So somehow he was able to break a bias, an unconscious or implicit bias, um, by doing something that was not expected to be associated with that bias, whistling classical music. Um, and this struck me, this, uh, the title of this book is very compelling, and the book is very well written. So we said implicit associations, or associations we make between things um, that affect our attitudes about groups of people. They may be based on appearance, they may be based on uh, perceptions, on language, on the way people carry themselves, their age, um, and they begin to develop over the course of our lifetime. So I was raised in a very ethnocentric, first generation immigrant family. And I know that those, um, that the attitudes, perceptions, and language in my home affected how I developed biases. And it's something that I've thought about a lot as I've gotten older and have grappled with. And I think the first step in sort of dealing with this topic, it's, a, it's an evolution for each of us and a journey for each of us. Um, but it's something where, um, 
it helps to continuously self-reflect how we've obtained our biases and what they may be due to and trying to bring them to the conscious level. So if we just talk about what we see, so I did a Yahoo search because I usually use Google and I used a different browser so it wouldn't have my memory in it, um, but just search the term doctor. So if you look here, um, there are mostly white men. And when we think about what a doctor looks like, it's generally what comes to mind. Some of the older folks maybe re remember growing up with Marcus Welby and what uh, those kinds of um, visions affect how we think of our profession and who is most likely to seem like a physician. And, and uh, so on the, uh, a plane, I fly Delta a lot, as most of us do in Atlanta, and I was going to the University of Utah to give a seminar about women in medicine. And I picked up the Sky Magazine for no apparent reason. There must not have been anything else to read. Um, but uh, on the cover is um, this photograph. And uh, Delta is touting their merger with other airlines and their partnerships. And, you know, obviously very proud of this picture. This is what CEOs look like. And it's interesting because I used this in another talk once in my department. and. Um, I said, gee, you know, this sort of struck me as, gee, these men are all the same height, about the same age, white, Asian. Um, there's not a lot of diversity here, and this is what we think of as CEOs. And uh, one of my colleagues came up to me after, and he said, I saw that magazine that whole month. Never occurred to me. Now I look at it, and it seems striking. Um, so it's sort of bringing awareness to the surface. Does anyone know who this is? Uh, this is Tamika Cross. So she was, she is a, was at the time an OBGYN resident on an airplane where um, a passenger got sick and they asked for a doctor. How many of you have had that experience? I've had it a million times. Um, and she was told to sit down because uh, they said they needed a doctor. And she said she was a doctor and they said, um, no, we need a real doctor. Um, so this kind of started the hashtag, and we've done it in our field, surgeons have done it, what a doctor looks like. An effort to broaden what we visually um, associate with a surgeon, a radiologist, a OBGYN physician. When we talk about women in medicine, your field does much better than mine. Radiology has been perpetually a male-dominated field. In fact, one of the worst of the clinical specialties, orthopedic surgery makes us look good. Um, but we're about 28% women faculty, and it's been that way for a long time. Um, in your field, it's uh, about 43%. But you see this same trend. In fact, your trend is steeper than than hours in terms of the fall off of women from junior ranks to more senior ranks and to leadership positions. So my field, there's 16% women chairs of radiology departments. It's about 12% in medicine. And what's been observed is that not only is progress very slow to increase women in academic medicine, uh, but that it has stalled over a number of years. And there's a book I'm reading right now called Why So Slow? And there's a lot of discussion about what are the persistent barriers and challenges and biases that keep women from accelerating in uh, proportion, particularly at senior ranks. So about, in academic medicine, about 22% of tenured professors are women. And that's been persistent for a while. This parallels most fields. Um, and I think what corporate America has learned what a lot of corporations have learned is that while we see the same kinds of trends of more women in entry-level positions and a real drop-off as we move to the C-suite, is that the top performing companies tend to, have, um, tend to have dampened that and tend to have more women in leadership positions. 
more diversity, are able to take um, advantage of a larger pool of talent. So I think we need to think about this issue organizationally as something in which it is in our best interest as being a competitive top organization to make sure, whether for social justice reasons or business reasons, uh, that we recruit the best and brightest and break down some of these barriers. So if we look across um, gender as well as ethnic groups, uh, again, the same kinds of patterns appear, slow progress uh, and uh, fall off as you get to senior ranks and leadership positions. What's also been noted, and um, some of the AAMC data shows that um, one place that there's been increases um, in the proportion of women and underrepresented minorities are in associate and assistant leadership positions. But that people may get stuck at those levels. And what's been shown is that women and underrepresented minority faculty tend to bear more of the burden of committees and service roles. And that's a lot of those assistant and associate positions do a lot of the heavy lifting in that. And while it's important that we all participate in service, while it's really important, um, that can also, if it's disproportionate, can take away from time and scholarship and other things that open doors for career advancement. <clears throat> so I know you've had talks about these forces and what implicit bias is. I wanted to focus a little bit on how it affects our workplace decisions and how we might have some of these barriers being so persistent. So I'm just going to show you a couple of studies and some personal experience. So this is a study that was done at NYU. A group of volunteers were shown this statement about a manager candidate, whether they wanted to work for this manager. And uh, it's just a very short paragraph. Subordinates have often described Andrea as someone who is tough yet outgoing and personable. She is known to reward individual contributions and has worked hard to maximize employees' creativity. So think about whether you want to work for Andrea. Another group of volunteers were told the same thing, except Andrea is James. No images here, just imagery from the words. Want to work for James. More people wanted to work for James and would prefer to have James as their boss. And we have to ask ourselves, why is that? I mean, there may be something about just having a woman boss that might be scary. I know it is for my faculty. Um, but uh, is, it, is it the word tough? Is that what we're uncomfortable with? So thinking about how we change gender or other terms and how we may have a different perception. Now, there are many resume studies that have been done um, <clears throat> that show if you just change the name, uh, that, that the name of an individual causes bias, whether it's a gender association or an ethnic association. Um, so here's a couple of job sites where resumes were posted and they were in just randomly assigned white sounding names like Emily Thompson and Ann Smith and Allison Benchmark or something, and African American sounding names, Aisha, Kaisha, Tamika, Tyrone, Tremaine. And do you think there was an effect of that bias? The resumes are the same. There was. There was about a 50% callback rate. And these kinds of results have been consistent across many studies. The NIH found this in grants a number of years ago and had to do a you know, significant sort of deep dive into why that was that there was a lower um, funding rate and lower scores associated with women's names on grants. What about when we're recruiting and writing ads to begin with, just starting out, thinking of a position. How do we um, 
potentially unconsciously narrow or broaden the pool of applicants. So if we use sort of hard charging terms like proven track record, you know, and someone who's assertive and hard driving and, you know, those kinds of terms tend to attract men more. And women may not see themselves as being qualified for those kinds of positions or maybe not as attracted to them. If they're couched in terms of sort of um, the environment, the people, um, a cohesive and, and continuous learning environment, those might broaden the candidates you get. So we need to think about language. And there's a lot of guidelines on this. So next time you think about writing an ad and you're thinking about the characteristics that you want in an individual, pay attention to the language and maybe look at some of those guides. We've put together a diversity toolkit on our website in radiology and we have links to these kinds of materials so that we can be guided by them. So, you know, if you are purposely building an inclusive work environment, you might think of saying that. Ability to, you know, you want someone whose ability to work in a diverse team. That sends a very strong message and it especially sends a strong message to millennials who look for that kind of language. Uh, they want to work in inclusive environments. Um, we all do, but especially this comes up in studies recently, in survey studies that suggest that that is a big part of the decision of where people are going to work. Um, being very clear about criteria, how much education, et cetera, taking out some of the wishy-washiness can dampen as we go through the selection process <coughs> Some of our implicit or unconscious bias. Pushing the button hard. There we go. Uh, so again, there's some charts of language. I won't go into them, but I think it's something we should pay attention to. <coughs> I wanted to share with you a letter of support. That, this is the main body of the letter of support that I got for a faculty candidate in 2016. Uh, we didn't get this candidate, I'm sorry to say. Uh, she was recruited to Stanford. Um, just uh, an incredibly talented individual. And uh, this is a letter from her mentor. <clears throat> so I don't have her name in here, but I'll just read it real quick. I can speak directly to, we'll say, Allison's uh, level of competency in diagnostic radiology. In that regard, she's highly intelligent, motivated, thoughtful, and a pleasure to be around. Allison's Intelligence is balanced with her personable nature. It's a pleasure getting to know her over the last five years to realize what a dynamic woman she is. She's a hard worker and easy to work with. That comes up again and again in women's uh, faculty letters. She accepts criticism well, that's important, and uses it to improve herself. She's always a team player, she's a vegetarian, and she's an amazing cook, which I think speaks volumes about her creativity. I want you to think about John in this letter and see if it would be incongruous and not what one would usually expect. We also look at that when we write letters um, about residents, about faculty, uh, letters about women candidates tend to be shorter. They tend to have more of the language of team player and creative and sensitive and easy to be around team player, won't give you a lot of trouble. Uh, with men, they tend to be longer. They tend to be more focused on academic accomplishments, hard accomplishments, and more focused on language about intelligence. So I'm sorry I've used her letter a lot, but it, it sort of struck me as odd. I had to look at the date. I thought it was quite um, odd. But let's talk about the kinds of biases. So you can categorize how they work. So. I know I've fallen prey to each of these um, when recruiting and hiring. And I've tried to make myself more aware of how they come into play. So affinity bias, I think that I have done this a lot. Affinity bias is when we have something in common with someone we're interviewing, boy, we like them a lot. We like self-reflection. You know, I. Um, 
you know, you, you could be interviewing someone, so tell me about this gap in your record. And then they say, well, I went off to um, start a dog rescue association. And I've done dog rescue, so I will spend the rest of the time talking to them about that and how cool that is. And it is cool, and maybe that says something about their perseverance, their creativity, um, but maybe not. And maybe I just feel like, wow, that was a great interview because I like that person. They, they're, they have similar interests. They went to the same school. They went to the, um, gee, you visited this place. So affinity bias is something that can really take us off track when we interview. And that's one of the reasons we have structured interviews in search committees, is so we don't get off topic like that. Conformity bias. So I'm running a search committee right now. It's, it's very large, and there's some very senior people on it. And it's been very hard to control for this. Um, but we've really been systematic about it. So conformity bias. So if I take a group of people around a table, you've interviewed someone, and I say, so what do you all think? And uh, your department chair says, oh, I love that person. And you were thinking you didn't like them that much, but Dr. Stevens knows a lot about picking candidates, and gee, he knows more than I do, so well, okay, I like them. And then by the time you get around the room, you're hiring the person. But maybe not everybody thought that way. So one thing that I've done in a number of searches is to, is to say everybody gets one minute, two minutes to just be objective about pros and cons of the candidate. Nobody is allowed to jump in. I've elbowed some people before and say, oh, I think so, or oh, how could you say that I disagree? Have everybody go around, start in random ways between each candidate going around, trying to avoid having the most senior people uh, go first and have everybody have a say and then have discussion. It helps with this, not that we don't have it, but this is a really strong force. Beauty bias, this is why most CEOs are tall. Um, we tend to be attracted to individuals who look nice. So that one's pretty easy to see. It also plays in when uh, of issues with um, weight, disability, scarring, and how that pertain, for, pertains to our assessment of whether somebody is equipped to do a job. There's also just perceptions we make about people's faces. Mazarin Banaji uh, at Harvard um, talks about this. If people's eyes are closer together, we think they look less intelligent. Their eyes are further apart we tend to think they look more intelligent. So there's perceptions we make just about people's faces, symmetry, et cetera. The halo effect, that's when they say a search committee's fallen in love with a candidate. Once you've decided that this is your person, you could then call up references, and they're maybe a little iffy, but you already are sold, uh, and you kind of have a halo around this candidate and, and tend to dismiss. Um, perceptions to the contrary. Attribution bias, we always think that everything we've accomplished is due to hard work. Things other people have accomplished, they're lucky, they had it easy, they were in the right place. So sometimes this plays in when we assess other people's accomplishments. It can also be when it really parallels our own field. Uh, and Confirmation bias is, is once we make a, a decision about someone, we're, oh, we're looking for more reasons that we're right. Um, I made the right decision not to hire that person or to hire them. So we talked about letters a um, little bit, and there's also this is seen in uh, medical student evaluations. Um, male medical students um, tend to be described in terms of intelligence, quick learners. Who doesn't want to mentor a quick learner as opposed to someone who might be enthusiastic or sensitive? So I'm going to share with you what I walked into um, my first um, oh, month as chair of the Department of Radiology in 2007. I was trying to figure out 
uh, well, this was 2006, but two, FY 2007, I was trying to figure out what the salary compensation plan, actually my predecessor didn't leave me one piece of paper, so I couldn't find any policies. And I thought, you know, well, I wonder how salaries are determined. Like, I said, well, I'm gonna figure out a formula because there's nothing written down. And I think I figured out the formula. Um, so there was almost a statistically, there was a lot of variability, but there was almost a statistically significant difference between the men and women in the largest group, which were assistant professors. Um, and this was a very difficult thing to walk into because then I couldn't keep this a secret. I had to show it to the faculty and say, this is where we are and how do we get out of it and this is not the world we want to live in. So we have a compensation plan that is obsessed with equity as a result. Um, but it took two years to dig out of the situation and I have to say the faculty were very uh, patient considering they then knew there were significant inequities in salary. Um, so I, at that time, that was when a lot of the, the book, Deborah Babcock's book about uh, women don't ask, so I thought there was no compensation system, so it was all about negotiation, individual negotiation with the chair, men are more comfortable negotiating, and um, thus, th that's, that's how we ended up in this situation. I think now that that was only half of the picture, and I'm gonna show you some data that sort of parallels this. Uh, and this is a study from a few years ago um, of science faculty at Northeastern Research Intensive Universities. And uh, the science faculty were asked about uh, students who applied for a lab manager position for the year. And uh, the applicants were randomly assigned uh, male and female names like the resume studies we talked about. And the faculty were asked to judge those resumes in terms of the student's competency, their interest in hiring that student, their interest in mentoring that student, which of course is a gateway to helping build that individual's career, and to assign how much they would pay them for that position. So <clears throat> in terms of competence, hireability, and their interest in mentoring, which I do think is sort of, again, a harbinger of long-term um, career success, um, they rank the male students higher. But in terms of the salary, they definitely wanted to pay the male students more than the women students, the men students more than the women students. And that gave me an aha moment when I saw this study, because I thought, this isn't a negotiation. This is what the faculty member thought was the worth of that individual. So if there is a shared sense of lesser value that will also contribute, in the absence of negotiation, that will also contribute to salaries being lower for women. This is why it is so important to have benchmark-driven, standardized salaries. In terms of retention, so sometimes we think, and thank you all for being here, because sometimes we think, oh, there's going to be a talk about diversity, which is why I called it something different. Um, that's for underrepresented minorities, or that's for women, or that's for other people other than me, I'm fine. Um, and sometimes if we don't all participate, then people who feel like it's not a really inclusive environment or as welcoming as we'd like to be, um, will feel like, well, it's not part of our core being. And the fact that you have leaders here who are sitting in the front row in this lecture speaks to that it is part of a core strategy and it is part of where we want to go. Retention is also really about feeling valued. And a lot of times we may be oblivious to the challenges, the systematic challenges that others face and minimize them. Oh, I think you're being paranoid. Oh, so someone got a bigger startup package. That's because, don't worry about it. So really being able to recognize that and really feeling valued is critical. So language. So I do this. I was so proud of Claire Sturk for being the first woman president of Emory that I kept saying we had the first woman president. And I saw this um, quote by Drew Gilpin Faust, who was the first woman president of Harvard, 
And I guess she got tired of that title and said, I'm not the woman president of Harvard, I'm the president of Harvard. So it reminds me of when my dad would sometimes tell me, I saw a lady doctor today, as if there was one other woman physician in the world and he had found her. Um, but he was very proud of that and he said it in the best possible way, like there's another one. Um, so we're guilty of that a lot, is when we describe, when we put that modifier, because it's unusual. Because this is a counter stereotype exemplar. This is not the stereotype of the president of Harvard, the president of Emory. Just like a woman chair is a counter stereotype exemplar. Um, so I was given this uh, a talk like this in my department, and I said, you know, women chairs in a male dominated field are counter stereotype exemplars, and it's important for people to see counter stereotype exemplars to know they're not, that they still, that they exist, and to change our perception. So I try to get in front of medical students, and I try to get, um, and he, and this faculty member said, I get it, and you're short too, so you could talk about that. So there are many ways, I shouldn't be where I am. But language comes in a lot. So this is something I've tried to pay attention to, um, and I don't know if folks saw this study, it's very recent. Um, this was in uh, sometime in the middle of this uh, past year, where I know it, it ran around Twitter and Facebook in addition to the journal. Um, but an observational study done showing that um, women giving grand rounds were more likely to be introduced by their first name than men. And particularly in uh, when men were introducing male speakers they more often said Dr. So-and-so when they introduced female speakers. Uh, they tended to um, say Jane is giving grand rounds. Bob and I have known each other a while, so we used Bob and Carolyn, and I think that's cool. <laughs> so um, being conscious of that. I think the first time I was conscious of this as a, an attending, I was a junior attending at the University of Pittsburgh, and. Um, there were four neuroradiologists standing around the division director, another male faculty member, <clears throat> another woman faculty member, and me. And someone walked in and the division director said, hi, I'm Dr. Smith, this is Dr. Johnson, this is Melanie and Carolyn. So being conscious of when we do things like that. He didn't miss a beat, he didn't think about it, he meant nothing by it, but it happens a lot. I, if I make a call to another physician and I say, and the assistant answers the phone, I'll say, this is Dr. Meltzer calling for Dr. Smith. Um, about half the time, the assistant will come back and say, Carolyn or Miss, or uh, you know, you can put Dr. Meltzer on. Um, is Dr. Smith's ready to talk to him. So we have to think about these. I have a a manager who told me once, he said, you know, the girls in ultrasound are doing great. And I said, the girls in ultrasound? He said, yeah, they're, they're just a great team. I said, we have underage um, employees in the department? That's terrible, there's radiation around here. Um, and, he and he looked for a second and he said, oh, you know, the ultrasound sonographer. I said, oh, our ultrasound sonography group, they're great, and our colleagues and professionals. And so it's funny because I have a good relationship with him and I kind of caught him alone and we talked about this and I kind of made jest of it. And he has corrected other people in the same kind of way many times. So language matters and we have to pay attention to it and we have to sort of create a safe zone. So the way we can comfortably remind each other to foam in and foam out we should be able to comfortably catch each other and say, you know, that's uh, Dr. So-and-so, that's not Jane, or, um, or when you introduce this person, you did the, oh, I didn't realize, thank you for telling me, I'll bring that to my awareness. All of this is about making it more aware. And similarly, for conference speakers, um, is, has anybody heard of the, um, site Bias Watch Neuro. It was featured in the New York Times a couple of years ago, and I've spoken to um, the uh, 
uh, head of the group that developed it, and it's quite a robust um, website now, but it tracks for neuroscience conferences uh, the um, proportion of women who speak in a conference and are on the organizing team. And those that fall below what is the median in the field um, are tracked versus those where it's above the median in the field. So it sort of gives folks a check. And you can self-report. I reported a conference I went to uh, and said, you, you know, and I called out the group that led it. And I said, you know, you have no women speakers and you have no women on the organizing. Oh, gosh, we didn't even think of that. Um, the next year, the conference focused on diversity and inclusion. So people want to be aware. They're just not. This also plays out in abstracts. So double-blind study of abstracts um, with blinding of the names increased the ranking at where uh, a woman was the first author versus a male. Said there was a bias, double-blinded it, corrected. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but when we talk about language, and I think we don't talk about microaggressions much. People feel like they know what that term is. Have you heard of that term before? Who's heard of the term? Okay. So these are things we might say or do that may minimize an individual, bring up an issue of privilege, bring up an issue of um, questioning otherness, um, minimizing challenges. So. I'm always amazed when someone says, I don't see color, especially when you talk about a barrier. And you may say, gee, you know, I'm cognizant of this barrier. Oh, it's not, I hire the best people. I don't see color. That also means I'm not making any effort to broaden my pool. I'm just, whoever comes to me, I know, I'm confident that I hire the best people. So things like that, things that play into stereotypes. It's probably worth having a discussion about these at some point. And there are some really good lists coming out, uh, and I think we're adding some links to our diversity toolkit um, that look at some language. And then you can look at these lists and go, oh, gee, I said that. I say that. Um, I can't tell you how many times somebody said I should smile more when I'm talking about a serious topic. I think I'm very funny. Not everybody thinks I'm funny, but apparently I should smile more so that I don't seem like I know what I'm talking about. Um, I'm being facetious. So we talked about this in the beginning. So why is this important? You could feel this to your core, and it could be really important to you on a social justice level. Um, and I always have this discussion with my husband um, because he says, yes, this is the reason we should care about this. I also think whether it's a big deal to you or not, we want to be the best organization, and we know that we will be better if we recruit the best and brightest, retain the best and brightest, use the talent pool that is out there, attract diverse talent, come up with better ideas with differing points of view. And my husband always says, well, it doesn't matter if it was economically better, it's still the right thing to do. Whatever your reason, we need to be doing more things like this, talking about this and putting action into place. So when I was at the University of Pittsburgh, they had a big lawsuit when I had first gotten there. And the lawsuit was about not they did not want to give same-sex benefits. So they won the lawsuit and lost a lot of scientists to Carnegie Mellon. And I thought, wow, what a great win. I mean, why would you want to do that? You create a barrier, you create a less inclusive environment, you're sending a strong message that's had you lose talent. So we need to think about these things, we need to think about our policies. So we could just sort of sit around and say, you know, if we don't change, something magical will happen. And there is change. It's just slow. 
And we could be more progressive and intentional about it. So leading with an active commitment. Commitment from leadership, but commitment from us all to talk the talk and walk the walk, to embed diversity goals in our in team building, in our strategic plan, um, to have a statement about diversity, then it's important and it's one of our core values. Practicing and creating a safe zone for gender neutral language, for correcting people about microaggressions. I should say educating and not correcting. Having a dialogue. Feeling safe and trusting to have that dialogue. How many folks have done the Harvard Implicit Association test? Okay, just some of you. I recommend it, and I think this is also a really good tool to help bring our own biases to the surface. None of us likes to admit that we have them, but we're all human. So, you know, recommend having a loved one nearby because you might not feel good after. Um, but this is about associations we make, and there are a number of them. I, I kind of, I always recommend starting with the gender career one. That's a common source of bias. And the race implicit association test, which was the original one. There's also one on skin tone. Uh, that was recently added, which is also quite quite good. And um, unfortunately, you can't cheat this test. So it's based on a principle that's used a lot in um, neuropsychological uh, testing, the Stroop effect. Have you heard of the Stroop effect? So um, I'm going to pick on Bob. Bob, can you read the colors here? Great. Yes. Read the colors now. The colors. <laughs> so re yeah. I think we've made our point. So the reaction time uh, definitely slowed when there was an incongruence between the word and the color. So if we have two things that are really well tightly associated and we kind of break them up and make them incongruous, our reaction time is going to slow. So if, um, if I built a bicycle for you with the handlebars switch such that when you turn the handlebars left, the bike went right, that would be a lot harder to ride than, than the conventional way. So what happens is this gives an idea then the strength of those associations that we have um, is mirrored in the test. Because when they're broken, your reaction time slows. So definitely recommend doing it. You can keep doing it again and again. It doesn't change that much. Um, I also really like um, Mark Neve was the prior um, chief diversity officer at the AAMC, and he was here a couple of years ago. In fact, did some workshops. Um, but he has a couple of articles written about the concept of diversity 3.0. Um, and you, you might liken this to our quality journey. You know, so diversity 1.0 is when we, you know, this is important, this is about fairness, and we have to do something. 2.0 is when we sort of have our diversity offices and we realize this training is important, and it's important for recruiting people, and, and it's important for the patients we serve, and this is an issue that's important. But we're not quite all integrated in the way we run our organizations. 3.0 is when uh, diversity and inclusion strategies are just an integral, seamless part of our people management. So nothing is ever quite 3.0, it's a journey. And I think about this like, um, I had this discussion with Hal Jones a number of times, like that this was similar to our quality journey. So when I started out in medicine, somebody said, well, we need to do QI. Let's take the least productive clinician and have them check some boxes in a corner, and we'll call them the quality officer. And then 2.0 is we realized quality was really important, and we set up quality offices, and we said, gee, we hope they don't cost a lot of money because we need to get the clinical work done. 
and our journey now moving to 3.0 is quality and our clinical care delivery are more seamlessly integrated. That's the journey we're on. So I think this somewhat parallels. This is a uh, publication by Deloitte that came out a couple years ago, which is about how as leaders, and we are all leaders, um, can foster a culture that is inclusive and what it takes to do that. There it talks about the commitment. The commitment has to be there. We have to agree that this is something important and that it is, is not just something we're giving lip service to, that there's a true commitment. And I think we all know when there's a true commitment. It also takes courage. It takes courage to speak up when we think that something isn't the way it should be. Or maybe we're making a decision collectively where bias may play to a strong role. But we need to speak up and have that conversation. And this is hard. When we think about search committees, we're really good at now putting women on search committees, having some diversity, any way from having, oh, there'll be one woman or there'll be one underrepresented minority, and then there's sort of the tokenism, you don't want to be the one to speak up, and it's as if you're only there to represent um, all women and underrepresented minorities in the world in their voice. But now we have more committees that are broader. We still don't appoint women and underrepresented minorities um, to leadership positions at the same rate as men. So we need to challenge each other. We need to say, are we making the right decision? What's coloring our perspective on this candidate? What is their systematic issues here? So speaking up, and that's not easy. Believe me, when my division director, and I was a junior faculty, called me Carolyn and called uh, my colleague, Dr. Johnson, I didn't say, hey, wait a minute, I have an MD too. But as we get more comfortable, as we develop a trusting environment, and as we're more senior, we feel more comfortable to speak up, and that's important. Cognizance. This is a journey. It's a journey for each of us. I feel more aware of my own biases than I did a few years ago. I keep thinking about this. I keep self-reflecting. I keep trying to think of how I can do better and how my department and our organization can do better, and that's really important getting these unconscious biases, getting to be conscious about it. And it's not a fun process. It can be difficult and painful. And curiosity. So in that trusted environment, your definition of diversity, your definition of an inclusive environment, your definition of challenges may be very different from mine. We have to share those views. And that's how we'll, we'll get there better and faster uh, and come to a better conclusion. being more uh, facile and having the right tools for cross-cultural interaction. So I'll share a mistake I made once. I had a senior faculty member I recruited into the department, and he kept calling me Dr. Belzer, and I'm very informal, and I said, no, you should call me Carolyn. And I said it a few times, and then once we met, I said, you know, please call me Carolyn. And he was from a culture, he was an immigrant, he was from a culture that is very hierarchical. And he was comfortable with that. And he said, okay, I will call you Carolyn, but I'm more comfortable calling you Dr. Meltzer. And I realized it was about me, it wasn't about what was important to him. And now he calls me Carolyn all the time, I feel bad. But um, <clears throat> so, so being aware of the other person's perspective. And you know, collaborating across groups. There's a lot of data that should just uh, diverse groups come to better conclusions, uh, can think more out of the box, but it takes some care and feeding to make sure that they work well and develop that trusted environment. So I really like this piece. So what can we do? We've talked about some of it, awareness, awareness, awareness is the first step. Training, you're doing it. Um, advocating that this is important. Amplifying each other's voices. Um, I didn't want to say this in front of Dr. Stevens, but the women cheers do this. We amplify each other's voices. There's a tendency sometimes when one of us says something, um, 10 minutes later, uh, a male chair will say it. 
And everybody goes, ah, oh, Jeff, that's a great idea. Why didn't anyone think of it? So we tend to amplify each other's ideas when we agree with them because we know sometimes they're ground out. The counter stereotype exemplar, getting in, so I feel like it's an obligation to get in front of students more often. They're not used to seeing women radiologists, not neuroradiologists. Um, having clear criteria for search committees for positions, diverse representation, um, emphasizing uh, the presence of biases and the need to, com to think about those and to take those into consideration and go beyond. Um, having clear criteria for performance evaluation salaries, the more ambiguous things are, the more likely bias will jump in. Uh, deliberate attention to the care and feeding of diverse teams, faculty development support, we have a lot of that here. Um, medicine, academic medicine isn't so good about um, a lot of tolerance for flexible flexibility. I mean, these are not jobs that don't take a lot of time and commitment, but we're getting better at that as a system, I think. I think my mom said this to me once. I'll just leave you with that cartoon. Thank you so much. I appreciate the honor of speaking to you. Well, that was great. Um, I'll start out with one question, which is entirely self-serving, because cardiology suffers the same fate as radiology, mm -hmm. in that when we look at the number of female faculty by division in medicine, mm -hmm. cardiology is the one that like 14 percent or something like that now mm -hmm. and you know one of the things we you know, so you've given us some good hints and strategies but how do you do it on a more global fashion because there is a bit of a pipeline issue mm -hmm. when I look at our cardiology fellowship applicants it's less than 20 percent female and while we accept over that mm -hmm. it, it is it is a narrow a narrow opportunity for us yep so I mean how, how do you how are you approaching that in radiology yeah, we're, we're spending a lot of time in radiology talking about this on a national basis because we have no pipeline. There's 28% women faculty, 28% women residents and fellows for the longest period. So we're not growing that pipeline. And the last several years we've had uh, large national initiatives to, to look at this and to say, you know, and to, we're, d we're taking um, some of the programs, I think it's called the uh, Nth Dimension, from uh, orthopedics that did, had some efforts to select promising medical students, attract them into fields, give them opportunity. We have um, diversity days for uh, residency. Um, so there's two ways of looking at it. One, we want our residents to be more diverse. So <clears throat> we have diversity days. We try to foster, you know, make, let people know we have an inclusive culture, that this is part of who we are, and we get more residents to come to our place, but that doesn't increase the pipeline. So nationally, we're doing a lot with medical students as well, uh, American Medical Women's Association uh, mentoring programs. I did a session a couple of years ago with the local chapter here at the medical students, and a first year resident came up to me and she said, oh, radiology sounds cool, but isn't it kind of a guy's thing? Um, so we do have you know, that STEM field for whatever reason, uh, we're just looked at as a guy's field. And if you have 80% of cardiologists are men, medical students will see that as it's kind of a guy's thing. So getting the counter stereotype exemplars out there in front of students and then delving into you know high schools, et cetera. Some of the things we're trying to do at the CTSA with women in technology and et cetera. But it's not easy. Not it's hard work. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, yeah, I think we do. So I think part of it is being really purposeful to seek women candidates. And we've struggled with this with the, um, several search committees. Uh, we also have to look at what we think is acceptable in preparation for those positions. So there are more barriers on the research side for women faculty. Women more often take the sort of service educator path. And then we may discount them, though, how, much, how successful they are in that path by saying, not a real researcher, can't be a chair. So I think we need to rethink the set of skills. We need to rethink what those barriers are at that early career development level. Um, and we need to be purposeful about grooming some of those senior leaders because you're um, just saying there aren't enough. There's just, there's nobody out there. We have to really seek them. I think for one search committee, I probably called every woman who is in a position nationally um, that could be eligible. Uh, it may not be successful, but we really have to reach out. We really have to broaden. Because that the impact of making the C-suite more diverse will pay off throughout the organization. People will then see, well, there's a leader who looks like me. I also went to a pen recently, I shouldn't say this, but I, I recommend they take all the white men off the wall, not because they're not important, not because they didn't do important things, but there is something about being a student and walking into a leader's office and looking around and saying, there's nobody here who, who looks like me, will I be a leader someday? We have one question from the uh, VA, from faculty over there. Um, I said when, when faced with hiring a single individual, can you please comment on how you can promote diversity and follow Title VII of the Civil Rights Act when you have just a single hire to make? Say that again, about uh, how, how can you how promote when it on a single individual basis? You, yeah, when, you're, when faced with mm -hmm. hiring a single individual, how can you promote diversity and follow Title VII of the Civil Rights Act when hiring? I'm not a lawyer. But what, I mean, I think what you do with a single individual is you just try to broaden the pool. You try to have more clear criteria, you try to reach out, uh, put your ads in places that, you know, we always place ads uh, for leadership positions in uh, ELAM, uh, in the National Medical Association. So uh, ads where you, and, and, and the type of language that will attract a broader pool. We have to be um, clear about the skill set we need. And we have to also understand what, what people bring to the table. So there may be folks who have different experiences and a different path, but maybe they'll be so complementary in what they bring to the group that maybe it's not what we classically were thinking. The person who did, you know, every step of the way went to the, you know, the schools we went to or the, so it takes a broad mindset and it doesn't mean that you say, oh, this person's less qualified, but I have to make a decision to take them because we need diversity. It's about making sure we understand the breadth of talent and that we reach out. And then each individual decision um, makes us richer because of it. Well, I think given the hour, we'll just say thank you there, but that's a fantastic uh, presentation. Thanks, thank Carol. You so much.